Hello and welcome back to another MIG Labs lesson video. It has been quite a long time since our last video, so uh, let's not waste any more time. Let's just dive right back in. As always, make sure that you click on the uh, button right down here, get the PDF. That way you can kind of follow along the lesson outline. You can also see all the references, so you can verify that what I'm saying is not made up. All right, so today's lesson, as the title says right there, is about compartment syndrome, and I'm excited about this one. I've been working on it for a while, so uh, let's get going. So normally I just draw everything, but I feel like in this example, uh, uh, someone else's drawing is going to help us kind of get started. So I pulled up this drawing here of a muscle, and you can imagine this is a muscle pretty much anywhere in your body. Let's just imagine this is up in your arm. Let's say it's your bicep muscle, but really this is just about any skeletal muscle right here. So when we talk about muscles in the body, we have to talk about fascial compartments. Fascial compartments. And uh, these are these closed muscle compartments. I'm just going to write compartments, closed muscle compartments. So essentially what you've got here, and we're going to switch to a blue, and we're going to look down here at these muscles. So we kind of look at this whole thing and say that this is the muscle, right? But if we look closer, we'll see that there's actually these groups of muscle fibers, and you can see here how they're, they're grouped together and surrounded by uh, what we call fascia. So fascia, which is the root word of the fascial we were just talking about, these fascia surround these muscle compartments and they kind of hold everything together. They make sure the muscle fibers are pulling in the right direction as opposed to just contracting anywhere. Uh, this fascia is extremely inflexible. So let's write that down here. Very, very inflexible. Extremely tough uh, tissue. Uh, I like to think about, you know, the gristle in your steak. It's, it's really similar material to that. It's very tough, uh, which helps us normally because our muscles can exert a whole lot of force. And so these fascial compartments need to be tough if they're going to direct that force in the right direction. As we'll see, though, that can have a downside uh, with compartment syndrome. So let me switch to a, a different picture here. So looking at this picture, we see uh, a cutaway view, sort of a cross-sectional view, and this is actually the lower leg. We know that because we have the tibia right here and the fibula right there. So these two bones there, we're looking at the leg just kind of sawed in half and looking at it cross-sectionally. And these colored outlines are outlining the four major fascial compartments in your lower leg. So again, just kind of driving home this point that our muscles are surrounded by fascial compartments. Um, the blue, green, pink, and purple right here. And to drive it home one more time, these fascial compartments are extremely tough and very inflexible. So they hold all these muscles exactly where they're supposed to be. So let's get rid of this picture and we'll start talking about compartment syndrome specifically. So I'm gonna kind of draw another picture from much lower quality, but let's imagine that this right here is a cross-sectional view of some fascia. So let's see if I can kind of like draw out 3D here, almost like we had in our last picture. So this is the fascia, and inside we've got these muscle fibers. And they're also running kind of lengthwise there. I'm not the best 3D artist, so hopefully you all can tell what I'm, what I'm talking about here. So this is a fascial compartment right here. We're looking at just one isolated fascial compartment. And let's imagine that we somehow get pressure inside this fascial compartment. So it's going to push out. Pressure is increasing, increasing. And the problem, like we've been talking about, is that this fascia, the white colored stuff here, is so inflexible, it's so tough, that it just cannot flex. It can't increase in size. So as that pressure goes up, something has to compress. And what we see is that these muscle cells kind of get pushed on, or these muscle fibers rather, they get compressed. And then, uh, man, I shouldn't use red earlier because now I want to draw a blood vessel. Well, here's a different shade of red. So there's blood vessels running through this compartment. And we've also got nerves. Uh, let's use green for nerves. So we've also got nerves running through these fascial compartments. And same thing, they're getting compressed as well because they're much more compressible. They're much less tough than the fascia. So all my little arrows here are just supposed to be pressure. Um, so this pressure is increasing and it's basically it's, it's focusing on the muscles, the vessels, the nerves. The fascia is kind of the, the last thing that's going to have any give because it's so much tougher than all of those things. The problem with this, 
uh, as you can probably imagine, is that as we push off on these vessels, they actually close off. You know, they pinch off. So we lose blood circulation. Uh, the nerves pinch off, so we can get nerve damage and some extreme pain, which we'll talk about later in this lesson. And even these muscle fibers can get pinched off and the cells can get damaged. The cells can be lysed, so those muscle cells can actually burst open and be destroyed as we increase pressure past a certain point. So this is obviously not good, and let's talk about the connection with rhabdomyolysis, because a lot of you probably heard of rhabdomyolysis, or it's oftentimes just kind of referred to as rhabdo. Rhabdo. Um, but the full version, in case anyone's curious, is rhabdomyolysis. Real fun word to say. So rhabdomyolysis is uh, basically as these muscle cells start to break down, they release myoglobin, and that's where the myo comes from in here. Myoglobin, which is almost like the muscular equivalent to the hemoglobin in your blood, but it's a protein. Uh, they release this myoglobin into just the kind of general, well, and really in the fascial compartment here initially, and uh, that's going to get flushed. So let's draw these little stars here. And these are the little myoglobin molecules. They're coming as these muscle fibers are being crushed and the cells are being lysed. This myoglobin gets released and eventually, sooner or later, it's going to find its way into the circulation. Now, if the pressure is really high and these blood vessels are completely 100% pinched off, then they're obviously not going to get into circulation right away. But at some point when the pressure goes down enough that you can get a little bit of blood flow in and out, you're going to get these myoglobin molecules flushed into the bloodstream. And just like anything that's in your bloodstream and not supposed to be there, we have mechanisms to kind of filter it out. So the, the number one here, let's, uh, let's really test my drawing skills now, would be the kidney. Hey, you know, that's not so bad. So eventually, sooner or later, all these molecules of myoglobin are going to make their way into the kidney. And this is bad because these are uh, very large molecules compared to the molecules that your kidney is normally filtering out. So it actually... Uh, clogs up, you know, imagine the kidney as a filter. It clogs up the filtering components of the kidney, and uh, if not treated pretty quickly, it can actually cause irreversible kidney damage. In really bad cases, you can actually um, completely kill the kidneys with a bad case of rhabdomyolysis. So this is a, a big concern, and definitely it's considered a medical emergency. So I want to draw this little cycle here, and this is also drawn a little higher quality in the outline. So we've got compartment syndrome. Compartment, man, I wish I could write faster. Compartment syndrome. And as this is happening, because it's pinching off the blood vessels, it can lead to ischemia. So just these cells don't get oxygen and they start to die. And that ischemia, as those cells die and release their contents, especially the myoglobin into the blood, this can cause rhabdomyolysis. And I'm just going to abbreviate it to rhabdo here. And that rhabdo, as things are being released, uh, causes the pressure to increase, it causes more swelling. And that swelling brings us right back full circle, which can worsen compartment syndrome. So you can see how it causes this um, kind of feedback loop where the compartment syndrome worsens the rhabdo and the rhabdo worsens the compartment syndrome. So if we don't get this treated quickly, uh, like I said, patients are in store not only for potentially permanent muscle damage, but also permanent kidney damage. Let's talk real quick, and I do mean briefly because I don't have a whole lot of info here, but uh, let's talk real quick about the epidemiology. It's hard to talk and write at the same time sometimes. Hopefully I spelled that right. Epidemiology, so who is affected by compartment syndrome? Um, obviously this can affect anyone who has muscles, so it can affect anyone. However, uh, typically we see that it's 10 times as many men as it is women. So this is much more common, much more prevalent in men and generally speaking, people who are affected are under the age of 35, less than 35 years old. Um, I'm not sure exactly why this is, but I can speculate, so this is my opinion here, but a lot of times we see this from extreme exertion, uh, and when you think about who is going to cause extreme exertion past the point of pain, past the point where their bodies are telling them to stop, generally speaking, it's young men who are doing that sort of um, physical exertion to the point that they're actually killing muscle cells. So to recap, this can happen to anybody, but it's much more prevalent in men, especially men under the age of 35. Let's talk about some causes. What can cause compartment syndrome? Oops, plural, causes. Um, so one, one common source is crush injuries. Uh, you can think about the people who are 
in collapsed buildings or under collapsed bridge or something and there's something very heavy concrete rebar whatever is, is pushing down on their muscles so that can actually be the initiating factor for the compartment syndrome uh, as a matter of fact these uh, the compartment syndrome was first really described in the medical literature after world war ii uh, victims trapped under the rubble of these bombed out buildings in um, the united kingdom would present to the hospital with swollen extremities, hypovolemia, dark urine, renal failure. And so I think at the time, people weren't exactly sure what that was, but they started researching it and discovered that it was a result of these crush injuries after they got pulled out of the rubble. And what they found is that a lot of these people showed up at the hospital and they weren't in great shape, but they weren't in terrible shape either. And, and so they got sent up to a floor unit for observation or maybe sent home and then they died a day later or so. Um, because of these these long-lasting effects and that cycle we talked about earlier. So crush injuries are a big cause. Um, today, we don't because we don't see so many crush injuries today, but the most common cause today is from long bone fractures. We're talking arms and legs here. Uh, the tibia and the radius are the most common. So I'll kind of do a little sub-bullet here. Tibial and radial fractures are the most common. Oops radial, not a rabial, tibial and radial fractures are the most common cause of compartment syndrome today. The most common mechanisms, uh, let's do another sub bullet here. The most common mechanisms are sports injuries, followed by motor vehicle collisions, and uh, falls, specifically ground level falls. So this is what we most commonly see in patients who end up being diagnosed with compartment syndrome. And then we're going to kind of continue our list over on this side. We also see it, as I mentioned in the last slide, uh, after people have really, really strenuous exercise. Uh, I'm actually not sure in the data, but I've heard anecdotally that with the rise of uh, CrossFit, that compartment syndrome injuries have actually been on the rise. So people who have pushed themselves really, really far, really strenuous exercise um, can experience compartment syndrome, even the in the absence of uh, traumatic injury. So they might not have an injury per se, they didn't necessarily fall or trip or have something fall on them, but just from pushing themselves so hard, they can develop compartment syndrome. There are also some uh, less common causes. I won't even bother writing them down, but I'll just kind of quickly read through a couple. Um, abdominal compartment syndrome, they're starting to see in people who get really high amounts of fluid. So people go to the hospitals and get a whole lot of fluid over, you know, say a week or, or a couple weeks, um, can actually develop abdominal compartment syndrome because all that IV fluid has nowhere to go and it kind of starts to collect in the abdomen because that's one of the loosest cavities in our body. And eventually it just causes so much pressure that the muscles in your abdomen can experience compartment syndrome. There have also been reports of compartment syndrome secondary to um, brachial artery occlusion after some medications were accidentally administered through what the provider thought was an IV, but was actually an arterial line. You know, so they'd, they'd stuck an IV catheter into an artery on accident. They hadn't recognized it was in an artery. They pushed some medication that caused the brachial artery in the arm to occlude. Um, so now we have all these muscles in the arm that aren't getting the blood flow. They're not getting the oxygen that they need, and they develop compartment syndrome. All right, so these are our most common causes. Let's talk about something very relevant to us pre-hospitally, and that's diagnosis. So what's going to lead us to believe that our patient might have compartment syndrome? So we have to look back at those last two slides, the epidemiology, so just the risk factors as far as being a male, being the under the age of 35, those are going to increase the risk factors. Again, this can happen to anyone, but they're going to be the, the highest risk group. Then we talked about uh, the mechanisms of injury. So these are ground level falls, really strenuous exercise, long bone fractures, motor vehicle collisions, um, potentially even being entrapped with some sort of heavy weight pushing on a muscle group. So now we've got the, the, um, the risk groups, the high risk groups, we've got the mechanisms. Let's talk about what we can actually see on exam. Uh, and historically we talk about the five P's, the five P's of compartment syndrome. So we'll go through those one by one. Um, first one is pain. The second one is pallor. And we'll talk about all these in a second. I'm just going to write them out first. The third one is pulselessness. Oh, it's a longer one to write. Pulselessness. The fourth P is paralysis. 
And the last P is paresthesia. Oops, paresthesia. All right, so let's talk them one by one. Um, pain, this is sort of obvious because we talked about in um, earlier on that the, the nerves inside these fascial compartments are being compressed, and that's a very painful process to have a nerve compressed from all around it does not feel good. Very significant pain. As a matter of fact, we oftentimes, here, let me uh, add on to this. We oftentimes use the phrase pain out of proportion, out of proportion to the injury. And I'm writing this out because, like I said, this phrase is actually commonly used when we're talking about compartment syndrome. So it's, it's uh, I think, valuable to recognize the phrase pain out of proportion to the injury. In other words, um, the patient's pain level is, is significantly higher than what you would expect given the injury. So say, for example, someone had a ground level fall, and now they're having true 9 or 10 out of 10 pain. Um, and I think you all know what I mean when I say true 9 out of 10 pain. So pain that's out of proportion to the injury, that's one of the five Ps. The next one is pallor, and this just means um, you know being pale. The reason they're pale is because those blood vessels have been compressed, so there's not very good circulation. So they start to lose the blood, they start to lose their color in that part of the body. The third one is, third one is pulselessness. Same thing here, as those blood vessels get compressed, um, at a certain point, if that pressure pushing on them is higher than your systolic blood pressure, you can lose pulses. The fourth one here is paralysis. Kind of the same thing as you lose blood and you lose nerve function, eventually you're going to lose the ability to even move that muscle group. And the fifth one is paresthesia, or as uh, I was taught growing up, pins and needles. And again, this is just part of restricting the, the oxygen through the blood and restricting the nerve function is you start to get these pins and needles or paresthesia. Definitely worth noting here that you don't have to have all five. So let's write all five, and then we'll go and say you don't need all five. As a matter of fact, I, I would... I would um, estimate that probably most patients do not have all five. They may only have two or three or four of these things. So don't think that just because your patient only has pain, pallor, pulsatus, and paralysis, but they don't have paresthesia, that it's not compartment syndrome. It doesn't work like that. Um, furthermore, children may have what we call a silent compartment syndrome, where they may only have one or two of these Ps. Um, so in, in a kid, they might only have the pain, or they might only have the paresthesia. So just kind of keep your index of suspicion high and don't assume that just because you only see one or two of these, they don't have compartment syndrome. Really look at your mechanism, look at your risk groups, and then look at these as well. Let's jump back for a minute to pain here as I'm reading my notes. Um, pain. So one thing you can do if you're not really sure is a, a passive stretch. And it's common in these, these patients to have pain with a passive stretch. Now this, of course, is assuming they don't have the really significant um, pain that's out of proportion to the injury. If they just have pain out of proportion to the injury right away, as soon as you look at them, there's no need to do more of an exam, right? They got the pain. But let's say you have a patient and you're thinking they might have compartment syndrome, but they don't have this terrible pain you'd expect to see in compartment syndrome. So you want to dig a little deeper. You can do a passive stretch of the muscle. And what this is, is where basically you, the provider, stretch their muscle for them. That's why it's passive, as opposed to active would be asking the patient to stretch their own muscle. So you just tell them to relax, sit real still, don't move, and I'm going to stretch whatever muscle group you're concerned about and if they have this really significant pain on a passive stretch that can be a red flag that's fairly common in compartment syndrome and this is also considered an early sign so this would be good to note again if you have a patient who your index of suspicion is high but the injury just occurred a few minutes ago um, they might not have developed full-blown compartment syndrome yet but you're being really diligent and you're thinking, oh, you know, this patient's at risk. Let me do a passive stretch. And they have really significant pain on passive stretch. You may have just caught early compartment syndrome. That's a great thing to pass on to the uh, emergency department so that they can kind of get ahead of it. You also may find that the area that muscle group is tense. I'm running out of room here. need a new slide. Maybe tense. Uh, and I've noticed this in the very few compartment syndrome cases I've seen is that if you like kind of tap on the muscle group with your finger, it feels almost like a tight drum. It's it's very um, tense, and that's because there's so much pressure inside that group that it just almost is a swelling up, uh, and it becomes, like I said, almost like tapping the head of a drum. I'm gonna erase this real quick and just talk about some additional diagnosis that they might do in the hospital. So in the hospital, they have a little bit more capabilities, obviously, than we do in the ambulance. Uh, and so one thing that they can do is actually measure the pressure directly inside this muscle group. 
they can measure the pressure inside the, or more specifically inside the fascial compartment. So they have a special tool. Um, it's basically just a needle attached to a digital pressure meter and they stick that needle into the muscle group. It does not sound like it feels good, but they can stick that needle into the fascial compartment and they can get an actual number, a quantifiable number about what is the pressure in that muscle group and they can make a diagnosis right there. Um, they can also take lab work. There are certain uh, lab values that will change with compartment syndrome. Um, specifically, we would expect to see creatinine kinase um, increased. And also, if you check the uh, urine, you'll find the presence of myoglobin in the urine. Sometimes they'll also do imaging, uh, MRI, or just a plain film, a regular x-ray. But I think, from what I've read, this is generally not very helpful. Usually, they're able to make the diagnosis without having to do any imaging. So they might do some, but it's not standard. All right, so let's move on to the good stuff. Let's talk about treatment. What can we do about it? You know, we got this patient who we suspect has compartment syndrome. We've gone through our risk factors. We've gone through our mechanisms. We've gone through our physical exam. And we say to ourselves, I think this patient has compartment syndrome. What can we do? So from a pre-hospital perspective, I like to tell people, um, think of this like a tourniquet. Imagine the compartment syndrome is like a tourniquet except unlike, say, a, a standard regular tourniquet, you can't just take it off because it's like an internal tourniquet. The, um, the combination of the increased pressure and this really tough fascia is creating a tourniquet. So what would you do for a patient with a tourniquet that you couldn't take off? Well, the answer there is that they need a surgeon, right? They need someone with a knife who can get in and take down this tourniquet. So first and foremost, these patients need a rapid transport to a hospital with some sort of surgical capability. Now the good news is that uh, one of the procedures they'll do to fix this in the hospital is a fasciotomy, which really any ER doctor probably is trained to do. If you have the choice, a hospital with surgical capabilities is better, but if you don't have the choice, any hospital with an ER should be able to handle this. Another thing is fluid resuscitation. Fluid resuscitation, man, I hate this word. It's so hard to spell. So. Fluid resuscitation is important to dilute that myoglobin. We talked about how the myoglobin in the blood can kill the kidneys. It clogs up the kidneys. And so we want to dilute that myoglobin as much as we can so that the kidneys are only dealing with small amounts at a time as opposed to the kidneys getting bombarded with this huge bolus of myoglobin. Um, and of course, anytime we're fluid resuscitating, we have to be careful about too much. We don't want to give the patient too much. But as much as you think they can reasonably handle, and again, we talked about how the, the biggest group affected by compartment syndrome is young, otherwise healthy um, adult males. So typically, a young, otherwise healthy adult male can handle quite a bit of fluid. So that's good. There have been studies that have shown start that uh, starting fluid resuscitation early, like at the scene, uh, reduces the overall incidence of kidney injury and improves outcomes. So this is one of those things where, yeah, sure, you could wait until you get to the ER and let them handle it, but the data says that by starting fluid resuscitation earlier in the field, um, that helps patients. And I should mention here that uh, crystalloid is just fine. So your normal saline or your lactate ringers, that's fine. It doesn't have to be any fancy fluid. In this particular instance, crystalloid fluid is all we need. Let me move back a second. So I did talk about we have to be careful about not giving the patient too much fluid. Um, so anytime you're giving patients fluids, there's a risk of pulmonary edema. That becomes really important here because if you're familiar with ARDS, A-R-D-S, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, we don't know a whole lot about ARDS, but we're pretty sure that um, inflammatory markers in the blood can actually promote or, or cause ARDS. And a patient who's in compartment syndrome or rhabdomyolysis already has increased inflammatory mediators. So they're, at a, they're already at a higher risk of ARDS, and now if we're giving them pulmonary edema, we're really pushing them into a dangerous zone. So just all the more reason to be super careful about fluid resuscitating. Diluting the myoglobin is good, but giving them so, many, so much fluids that they develop pulmonary edema and ARDS is much worse. So give them fluid, but use your assessment skills. Make sure you're not giving them too much fluid. And once again, let's talk about the treatments that they'd actually get in the hospital. Uh, so I, we already mentioned earlier that they're going to have, most likely, a fasciotomy. And uh, this is actually a pretty wild procedure to watch if any of you ever get the chance to observe. But they literally go and they just cut the, fascial, uh, the fascia, the fascial layer. They cut it with a, a scalpel and just allow the pressure out. 
So they, uh, they allow the muscle cells and the nerves and, and the blood vessels and everything inside that fascial compartment to decompress. And if you watch it, it almost like pops. As soon as they, they cut the fascial layer, everything kind of pops out and then it just stays there. And nothing's actually like falling out or draining out necessarily. It just is, is open and, and there's less pressure. And then in a day or two or three days, that pressure goes down. Everything kind of shrinks back into the fascial compartment and they'll go and sew it up and the patient's good to go. Um, they have found that delaying the fasciotomy is bad. So let's say here, early. Patients who have delayed fasciotomy, say they get to the hospital and the doctor's like, well, let's wait and see. They tend to have pretty poor outcomes. So uh, a lot of experts are really pushing early fasciotomy. Once you know they have compartment syndrome, they're saying just do the fasciotomy. Um, as far as I know, I don't think there's any EMS agencies in the country that are allowing their providers to do fasciotomy in the field. So I'm not telling them to do this, but you know, who knows? Talk to your medical director. But this is more what happens in the hospital. And then another interesting uh, component here is delayed closure of the fasciotomy site. So like I said, they'll cut it open and then leave it for one or two or three days, however long it takes the swelling to go down. They won't close it until the swelling goes down. Um, and, and again, kind of going hand in hand with the, the last bullet point, if we, they close too early, early closure, they've found data associating that with a bunch more problems and even recurrence of compartment syndrome. So they go close early and then the patient develops compartment syndrome all over again. So they're telling people do the fasciotomy early and then delay closing it until you're really comfortable that, um, that the compartment syndrome is gone, the pressure is normal, and the patient can be sewn back up. All right, so let's recap. Let's do a summary here. Um, so we have these, these fascial compartments, these, these groups of muscles that are surrounded by really tough fascia or fascial tissue. If there's swelling, we get compartment syndrome, which is basically just a, a swelling inside, I'm going to abbreviate CS compartment syndrome. It's just a swelling inside these fascial compartments. Untreated, this can lead to, I'm doing an arrow, can lead to rhabdomyolysis. So if we don't take care of it, Real quickly, now they can develop rhabdomyolysis on top of the compartment syndrome, and that rhabdo can worsen the compartment syndrome, which can worsen the rhabdo, and we get this cycle, this spiral. We want to treat it. Let's switch to different color for treatments now. We want to treat with fluids, fluid resuscitation, but being very careful not to overload the patient, not to give them so, so many fluids that they develop pulmonary edema and maybe even ARDS. In the hospital, they're going to get a fasciotomy. And just to recap here, let's see one more color. This is a true medical emergency. Patients with compartment syndrome, we need to treat that like it is a true medical emergency because it is. So make sure that you're being real, real uh, aggressive about making sure these patients are transported and uh, followed up in the ER. All right, that's it. If anyone has any questions or, or comments or you disagree with anything, please feel free to write something in the comments. And I uh, really look forward to hearing from you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.